Good morning, New Hope. Good morning. How's everyone this morning? Okay. Well, why don't you all stand and, and join us in uh, worship? Let's all use our best voices for the Lord this morning.
Angels we have heard on high, sweetly singing o'er the plain, and the mountains in reply, echoing the joyous strain. love this time of season and Christmas and Jesus coming. How about you?
Dear Lord, we want to thank you for this day and for these people and the large attendance we have this morning. Thank you, Jesus, for all you do for us. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Amen. Well, hello, New Hope. <laughs> Woohoo! I tell you, there is nothing greater than us spending time and offering our worship unto God because he prepares the soil of our hearts to receive all that he has. And I pray that you came here expecting God in a real profound way to impact your life and your circumstance because he's real, he's alive, and he, I believe, has a wonderful plan and a purpose for your life and mine. Amen? Amen. Well, listen, I just want to welcome everyone and uh, especially our first-time guests. And uh, I want our first-time guests and returning guests to know how New Hope is a place for imperfect people to belong, to grow, to serve, and to find healing and hope. And we endeavor to do that by loving Jesus, loving people, and serving our city and the world. Now, I want to just mention real quickly that um, next weekend, uh, we, uh, these guys did a great job. Didn't they do a great job? Yeah. Woo! I tell you. Awesome. Thank you. Next weekend, uh, we're having uh, uh, a candidate for our, uh, to be our worship minister come. They're going to lead uh, worship. And uh, it's going to be an opportunity for us to get to know Paige. Her name is Paige Williams. And uh, for us to get to know her, her to get to know us. And so I'd really encourage you to, to come and, uh, and uh, give her a nice shout. Uh, she's from Georgia. And uh, so is that a hoot or a hout? I don't know how you say that. So, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we're going to give her a nice uh, New Hope welcome. And uh, I just, uh, I'm really excited about the weekend and uh, looking forward to that. So let's just kind of share that hooting around and just say hello to someone, greet someone, invite them out to lunch, make a friend. Thousands of years ago, 
prophecy was given. It foretold the coming of the one sent from God in the image of man to take away the sin of all mankind. The prophecy is being fulfilled. Many tried to prevent his birth. Tell me where he is so I may worship him. Do whatever it takes. They knew he would forever change history, the future, and eternity. This Christmas, we do not just celebrate a babe. We celebrate the King of Kings. The Lord of Lords. Jesus Christ. Messiah. Forever and ever. Amen. All right. I thought that was pretty awesome. How about you? You know, did you know that if you listen closely and carefully, that you can hear the song of Christmas in the Old Testament? Written over a thousand year period, the first part of the Bible contains 300 references and prophecies about the Messiah, which we now know in the New Testament were fulfilled in Christ Jesus. Most of these prophecies were written about 300 years before the birth, life, death, resurrection, and ascension of Christ Jesus. It's not an accident, nor do I believe it's a kawinky dink. Our, our salvation, our redemption, our victory is already written. If we would just listen to God and be born again by the power of the resurrection. Now, before we go any further and address that with the truth of the scriptures, let's take a moment, bow our heads and pray. Holy Spirit, we invite you to come, Lord, and soften our hearts that we may hear and respond to you in a way that honors you. Father, let us be able to experience you in ways like we never have. But Father, like Adam and Eve, many of us do not believe how massive and incalculable the consequences of evil and sin are in our lives. And so, Lord Jesus, we, we ask you, come and remove the blindness from our eyes so that we may see your grace, we may experience your mercy, that we may be consumed by your loving kindness. And we ask this all in your son's precious name. Amen. If you have your Bibles, tablets, cell phones with your Bibles in it. Just pull those puppies out for me. That'd be great. Um, and uh, turn with me to the book of Isaiah. And uh, we'll be reading from uh, chapter 65, starting with verse 25. And it says, The wolf and the lamb will feed together. The lion will eat straw like the ox. But dust will be the serpent's food. They will neither harm nor destroy on all my holy mountain. Now, every scholar pretty much agrees that this prophetic message given to the prophet Isaiah is really speaking about the millennial reign of Christ coming, the thousand year reign. And what we see here is that the wolf and the lamb will feed together. Right now, that's an impossibility. There's so much hostility between a wolf and a lamb. They tend to devour, well, one tends to devour the other. And what we're going to see in the millennial reign of Christ is that all that's going to change, except there's one thing that doesn't change. And I don't know if you kind of caught that. It says, but the dust will be the serpent's food. And right here, 
what we see since the beginning, that the serpent is under the curse as a, as a permanent symbol of the pronouncement of what God's judgment was on the serpent. So even in the millennial reign, the serpent is still going to be eating dust. Now, that has huge implications for us. And I, a lot of times, I don't know if we really fully get a grasp of it because we don't spend enough time in the Old Testament to be able to allow that to go deeper and to really begin to see what God has done in this unbelievable plan of redemption and salvation in your life and in my life. Let me see if I show you another uh, passage here. If you turn with me to the uh, Gospel of Luke, chapter 24, we'll be reading from verse 25. Uh, now, those verses are in your sermon notes if, in your weekend program, so you can just kind of follow along, and there's some uh, fill-ins there for you as well. Verse 25 says, He said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, if you read further in the chapter, this is very great. I really encourage you to do that. This is where we see the two disciples that are on the road to Emmaus, and Jesus comes to them after the resurrection. It's one of the, one of the, the uh, first sightings of, of, uh, of Jesus uh, talking with disciples. And the disciples, after everything that was going on, they were so discouraged because Jesus was, you know, was crucified, and now they're wondering, was he the Messiah? And then he begins to instruct them from the Old Testament. I, I love that. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained all these things about who he was and that the Messiah had to suffer. And it's so important for us as we look to grow deeper and deeper in our understanding and revelation of who Jesus is and how great this redemption, salvation that God has spoken to us that it is real, it is alive, and we can build our lives on it. And maybe what ends up happening is sometimes we say that we believe God, I believe God, but we tend to live our lives like he doesn't exist. And I believe a lot of that is because we haven't allowed the truth of God to really go deeper and deeper into our lives so it becomes more of a living thing than just a cognitive exercise in our mind. And that's, that, I believe, is so important for us. And not why we gather and why we worship and why we study the, the scriptures daily and why we pray and all these things because we want God real and alive where it's just not a mental exercise. It's just not an outward veneer. It is a life-transforming connection between Almighty God and his creation. And I think that is just incredible. What ends up happening, but as we see here in Jesus' own words, he says, how foolish are you, Eddie? How slow of heart to believe, Eddie? Well, there's sometimes, yeah, I believe, but I got to, Lord, help my unbelief. Many of us are going through circumstances in our life, trials, tribulations, sicknesses, whether ourselves or finances, and we're, we're, we're at our end's rope, and don't know what to do, and what ends up happening is then we try to take matters into our own hands, and we're bitter, and we're angry, and we're fault-finding, and we're like the lying, devouring one another. And a lot of it just has to do that we have not put our trust in the promises that God's given us. And we end up building our lives on false assumptions, and sometimes we have false doctrines and false theology that we build our lives on because we haven't allowed it to go deep. We haven't spent our time in the Old Testament to allow the truth of God to explode out of the New Testament. And so we end up living our lives on beliefs that are half-truths and myths. And this is what ends up happening. We end up becoming religious, and religion kills. We've seen that for thousands of years. Religion kills. 
But Jesus came to set us free in life. And one of those things I think is very evident is even in our own culture, society, is when we come as we're kicking off this Advent season, many of us might have wrong understanding or incorrect understanding of what Christmas is really about. What is Christmas really about? Presents, candy, family get-togethers, an economic boost, a cliche war of either Merry Christmas versus Happy Holidays. Sadly, all of these questions are confronting you and me every year. But this Advent season, let us see how Christmas is really about the greatest, the most important promise ever made to you and to me in all of human history. And that's why I'm kicking off this new teaching series here today called BC, Before Christmas. Because we should not be surprised to encounter Jesus in the Old Testament. Now, while it's true that in the Old Testament, the, the, the New Testament begins with the birth of Jesus, without the stories, without the prophecies, without the Psalms of the Old Testament, we cannot fully understand all that salvation in Christ entails. So, through the ancient paths of the prophets, you and I are going to trace out the development of God's plan of salvation to redeem the world, which ultimately, all of human history, as we're going to find out through Scripture, is actually pointing you and me to a person, to a Messiah. All of human history. And we're going to have to go back and see that. And I, as we continue to examine today's scriptures, we're going to explore the, the first prophecy of the Messiah's coming, which comes out of the seed of the woman or uh, the offspring of the woman. Because embedded in the middle of the curse, there's a promise of a Savior. And I believe this is best understood when we consider that the God who inspired the writings of Scripture rules over history. And so when he gives a promise, he is faithful to fulfill and accomplish it in your life and in my life. And that teaches you and me how God is by his very nature a savior, a redeemer, and marked by loving kindness. So like Jesus, as we are all made in his image, being God, our victories in Christ will not come without wounds or bruising. And I know you don't like that. I know, I know, I know. No, no, I, I want the power, I want, the, I want all the signs and wonders and miracles, but I don't want any of the other stuff. Well, Paul said that I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and in his happiness, sufferings. And as we learned the last previous two weeks in the book of James, we realized, as James was teaching us, that ultimately that it's during those times of trials and tribulations and troubles that the benefit of Christ and the body of Christ explodes in our lives. And it's during those times. And it's really during the times of comfort and ease is when we begin to take God for granted and we begin not to experience the wonders of God. And that kind of leads us a lot of times, not all the time, but a lot of times in being more religious than it is being a disciple of Christ. And so our victories in Christ are all possible first 
by us seeing the glory of Christ in the Old Testament. That's what we're going to begin. For us to go deeper, to get out of the shallow end, and to begin to go deeper, you and I are going to have to wrestle with the prophetic messages of God in your life and in my life. Because the God who spoke then, I believe is the same God speaking to you and me today. God is speaking, but are we listening? And that's why we go back. So turn with me to Genesis, and we're going to go through the first uh, prophecy here, Genesis uh, chapter 2. And um, starting with verse 12, it says, this was in the Garden of Eden, right? And um, Adam and Eve had, had um, eaten the fruit. God had told man, where are you? And uh, of course, he knew where he was. He was trying to help Adam and Eve see their own condition. And, uh, and then we, can, we start here in verse 12. Chapter 2, verse uh, 12. The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. There starts the blame game. The reason why I'm not happy, the reason why things are going well, your fault, your fault, your fault, me, I'm perfect. I never do anything wrong. Right? Verse 13, then the Lord said to the woman, what is this? You have. The woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I hate. All right, more. Oh, the reason why I'm not getting my best fruit because of you and you, and you're causing me not to advance at work or, or my family, or I, I can't be in this relationship. And there we go. Blame, 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 right? Right in the beginning. And what has changed? Nothing. But something has changed. Verse 14, so the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock and all the wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. So it, it seems there that he wasn't crawling on his belly before. Take note of that. And you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring or seed, you, that translate in my NIV, if you go down to the bottom, it says either offspring or seed. And hers, he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Here is where we come and you got to really begin to look into the text. It's gonna, we're going to see the first prophecy of what God is doing here. And I think this is where you and I begin to build because God builds on this. And his whole plan of salvation and redemption is flowing out of this particular text. So let's look here in verse 12 and, uh, and the beginning of verse 13. It says, the man and the woman. There's three things I want to pull out of here, out of this text. First, we're going to see God's people. Let me just say that you are very important to God. Matter of fact, he is jealous for you. In other words, that he's intentionally, not the, not the negative jealousy that we see with the stalking type thing, okay? That, 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 take that out of your mind, all right? We're talking about that God has intentionally poured out his affections on you, and you don't deserve it. And the only way I can explain that is when my sons were born, I was there for each one of my sons, and mamas, forgive me, okay, before, don't write me the email, all right? But my sons, when they first came out, I was like, woo, put that thing back. They, woo! Their heads were flat, I mean, squished. I was like, whoa, what in the world is that? I mean, come on. Anyway, but from that moment, I have poured my affections on those kids. And that has never changed to this day. And it doesn't matter what they've done. I might not appreciate some of the things they've done. I don't appreciate a lot of things they've done. But, uh, but my affections, my jealousy for them is unwavering. And in a similar way, God's affection for you is unwavering. And you need to see that when God addresses people, he addresses his people as a father, as an Abba father, who's poured out his affections on you. And so what we're going to see here clearly, and you've got to put on those lenses, okay? God's people, his, his people is Abba father. And then what we're going to see next then is God's plan. 
And then finally we're going to see, okay, what's the purpose? And this is all going to fall out of this prophecy. God's, God's people, God's plan, and God's purpose. All right? Now right here he addresses the man and the woman, okay? God's people. Very simple. Verse 12 and 13. God's people. And what we see here, as we read before in the past, is this, uh, that because they ate of the fruit, there's endless conflict in humanity. Matter of fact, what happens, there was one humanity here. Now what we see is that there's going to be two humanities coming out. Okay, what, do you, what in the world do you mean about that? This is what God was trying to tell Adam and Eve, don't eat of the fruit, because what you're going to do is cause a division that's going to bring sorrow, grief, death, sickness, disease, war. But the enemy came along, and we know that the enemy was initially judged in heaven, and he was cast out, right, with a third of the angels, and he came to the earth, and he, this, we read in Revelation, he was angry. I think he was more angry now that he got booted out of heaven, and he was going to take it out on humanity. And then the enemy came along, and he came up with a plan to win the affections of humanity to himself, to pull them away from God. And when he did that, humanity split. Matter of fact, we see that in the New Testament when the kingdom of Israel splits. And all we see is grief and grief. You see this pattern throughout history, this pattern. And Immediately, if you continue reading in Genesis, what you're going to see when Adam and Eve have their children, Cain kills Abel. And the reality has been that since that time, the Cains of the world have been killing the Abels, and nothing has changed. We have sorrow and grief and misery on a scale, and God in his loving kindness said, don't do that, but what ended up happening was that Adam and Eve chose to believe the enemy, to trust him. And you know how it is. I mean, I, <clears throat> my, my, my sons are all grown men now, but when they were in their teenage years, they always saw me as the enemy of their fun. Yeah. Well, well, I mean... Change your diapers. I mean, I mean, I fed you, clothed you. When did when did I become the enemy now? Oh, I want to hang out to one o'clock in the morning. No, you know. Oh, I want to I want to go out and drive the car. No, you know. And I'm the enemy now. And I wonder what happened. And in a similar way, I believe this is what happened here with Adam and Eve, because look at what. If you read there in chapter 2 in the beginning, I encourage you to do that. The enemies think, that, listen, did God really say that? That you shouldn't eat of that? And then when he couldn't get through that, they go, no, I think he did say that. And then Eve kind of like twisted a little bit and it got all crazy. And then he said, well, the reason why God doesn't want you, because God, God doesn't want you to have fun. I mean, he doesn't want you to be like him. Because he knows if you eat and you get knowledge, whatever, then you'll be like me. And you'll be cool. And you can go out and hang out all night long and drive without a license and, and do all kind of crazy stuff. And it's going to be okay, right? And guess what we did? Oh, well, that sounds great. <laughs> and we are in the condition that we're in because of that. I mean, I think that, now, okay, God gave us a brain. I want us to... Use our brain. God gave us a brain. And, and God gave us this, this great imagination. And um, I'm going to stretch us a little bit. And so if, if, if I take you out of your theological comfort base, I'm sorry. But when I think of, all right, just kind of put that cap on. When I think of God kicking the enemy out, Satan out, the devil out with a third of the angels, and he casts them out, and it, the scripture tells us that he was so angry. I believe that 
he, he, he was more upset and more determined now to prove that God was wrong, that God couldn't be trusted, that basically he's hindering us from having fun. And so when he comes to earth, uh, just think about this for a second. When he comes to earth, his primary mission then is to say, okay, the pinnacle of your creation, uh, as we know, and Genesis and, and, uh, on the sixth day was humanity. And if, if I can win the hearts and minds of humanity, then that will prove that God is not sovereign, God is not in control, and that, you know what? You can just worship me, because I'm just as, I am equal with God. If not, I'm better. And that's why the judgment came and he was cast out of heaven. And we bought into this lie. And so from that moment in, we brought in death and sickness. And we now have conflict. There, Adam and Eve had no idea how massive and incalculable evil and sin was going to be in their life. And there's this division in humanity. And I want you and I to understand that. Because when we appreciate that, we begin to say, Oh, Lord, I need a Redeemer and a Savior. And so God's people are now hurt and broken. And I want you to think about that, if you could, in your own minds of your own children who will do all kinds of things that you appreciate and things that you don't appreciate, but your heart aches for them. Your affections has poured out to them. You're jealous for them to be able to get the benefits and, and the beauty of life, and you, you want the best for them. You know, my heart cries out and says, Son, I want you to have the good things in life. Please don't choose the bad. And I want you to see, here's God's heart. In this scenario, in this situation, come into that. And so he addresses the man and the woman. And I believe here the enemy thinks he's triumphed. He believes that ultimately, and what's happened is that now Adam and Eve have chosen the devil to be a friend, and God has now become an enemy. You say, well, Eddie, that's a little extreme. Well, the scripture tells us that. He says, even though you and I were at enmity, enmity means enemy with God, he still died for us on the cross. And so at that moment, Adam and Eve chose. And this is what happened. The problem is, is that that has affected us throughout all of human history. Nothing has changed. Our rebellion passed down has not changed. And the enemy thinks that he won. See? I won. God's not in control. God has no power. I won the affections of Adam and Eve. They're mine. And what I think that some of us might have fallen into that trap. And we look at our circumstance, we look at our relationships, we look at our marriages, we look at our children, we look at our finances, and immediately we believe in possibility. Immediately, God's not in control anymore, and now i got to now take control, and that's, that, that mentality has been passed on from Adam and Eve to us today in our generation. Nothing has changed. That's what the scripture defines as rebellion or sin. And all of a sudden now we think that God isn't able to do that, and we are. Well, let's go further on and see what he says here. Verse, uh, the end of verse 14, um, beginning of verse 14, he says, So the Lord said to the serpent, here now we're going to start seeing God's plan. God's people divided. The sons of Cain are killing the sons of Abel. There's now a division. Death, hell, sickness, disease, war is now ravishing every generation from that moment on. And it seems absolutely hopeless. There's no hope. 
We fall into this condition. God has now thrown Adam and Eve out of, out of the Garden of Eden, and we're lost. And I want you to see here a few things as God addresses the serpent. He said, so the Lord said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all the livestock. And so now there is a pronunciation of a curse over Satan. We now know it's over all of creation because now lions are eating lambs. Wolves are eating everything and on and on and on. And there, now all of creation is at war and devouring itself. Even on a cellular basis. Sickness, cancer, disease. Okay, most, when you look at, uh, again, I'm not a biologist or a doctor, but I read, okay? And uh, a lot of times you have these cells in your body that end up devouring or destroying the cells, and we call that cancer or some other type of ailment, whatever that may be. Even on a cellular basis, you've got to understand that the fabric of creation now is under this curse. And when he speaks this curse, I want you to see that the first thing he does is he addresses the enemy. He said, Cursed are you above all the livestock and the wild animals. And I think this is important because there's two things that are happening here. One, the enemy thinks he won. And then God goes, uh oh, wait a minute. I am now going to give you a directive. And I want you to get a picture in mind. I, I heard this illustration once. I, anybody ever saw the, the, the commercial, the gecko? Right? Anybody? You've seen that? Right? Okay, everybody knows the gecko. He's cute, isn't he cute? Oh, he's cute. Cute little gecko, little bulgy eyes, you know? And, and I want you to think about that for a moment because before the curse, imagine the serpent as a little gecko. Cute. Cute. And then upright, walking around, right? And then all of a sudden, because of what he did, now, there's a, now he's the most ugliest, vile creature that we have just read that even in the millennial reign, he's going to stay in that condition. And now he, instead of him being upright, he is now on the belly, crawling around, eating dust. And what, I tell you, what a pronouncement, huh? And there's two things we see here. One, there is a physical impact of our sin, the enemy's sin, and our sin. I literally believe, now I'm getting into my own opinion, and you can wrestle with this on your own, but I believe the picture that we get here is to see that ultimately that the enemy sinned and it affected him physically. I believe when you and I sin, it affects us physically. Matter of fact, I believe guilt, shame, condemnation, hatred, bitterness, unforgiveness actually makes us ugly. We go from this beautiful gecko into now this slithering thing and the bitterness and the vileness that comes out of our mouths and our intentions and our attitudes and how we treat one another. I literally believe there's a... The, the only picture I can get is that we're not... For many, many years in law enforcement, when, when people who are struggling with addiction, like drugs or alcohol, crack, you know, I mean, whatever the case may be, that when, they're, when they are in bondage to their addiction, it literally transforms their body. And you're sitting there going, whoa, dude, man, that, man, that's terrible. What's, you know, like, eat something. I mean, something. And then when God delivers them, and they start to eat and, and, and take bread of their, their whole, their, physically it changes. And I believe in a similar way, that's how sin affects your life and mine. There is a physical impact. And then there's a spiritual impact of ultimately that there is a death and separation between us and God. That we literally now have split humanity. Sons of Cain, sons of Abel. And this is the beauty of it. God loves the sons of Cain, and he loves the sons of Abel. 
his affections have poured out on them. And God makes a way out of his loving kindness because he's jealous for you and me. He makes a way for the Cains and the Abel to be restored and come back. And that's where you and I have a limited amount of free will and choice in God to choose. Will we continue to believe and say the enemy is our friend because he's, he's going to let me do whatever I want. I'm going to stay up all night long. I'm going to drink and drug and do whatever I want and whatever, and he makes me happy. Or am I going to go and follow the Lord and say, no, he is my hope and he is my salvation and he is my redeemer and he is the one that is the only one that could really satisfy my heart, my mind, and my very soul. And when we put our heart and our trust in him, he is the one that satisfies our soul. He is the one that gives us a hope and a new being. He is the one that sets us free. He is the one that gives us a sense of purpose and destiny. And we realize that there's nothing else in this life that's ever going to satisfy us. And maybe we have built a lie or believed a half-truth and we think money, wealth, possessions, we think our house, our car, our career, our education, we think if we go on enough vacations, enough cruises, if we visit enough landmarks, that somehow we're going to finally find the satisfaction of soul. And none of that's negative. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I'm just saying if we're trying to find, if those things are what you think is going to satisfy your soul, you're believing a lie. They cannot. They were never designed and created to be that. There's only one being in all of history. All of human history is pointing us to this one person, and he is the satisfier of your soul. He is the lover of your soul. He is the one who's going to give you hope and a life and a purpose. He's the one who's going to set you and me free. And there's none other. And I want you to understand that I believe that when, and I'm getting into my own personal opinion, I believe that when God gave this pronouncement of sin, of, of a curse over, this, over, over Satan, I believe this, that, that he actually understood the prophecy. He understood it in a way I think that you and I didn't understand it. Well, why do I say that? If you look now throughout the pages of Scripture and all all of the historic value from the Old Testament and the New Testament, you're going to see a singular plan of the enemy. Destroy the people of God. Destroy the children. And you're going to see from Pharaoh to Herod, okay, and through all of human history, the slaughter, even to our day, and the 1.2 million babies a year that we slaughter here in the United States, we're slaughtering the children. That, I believe, comes from the pit of hell. And the enemy has, throughout all of humanity, if I can just destroy the seed of the woman, because he knew that God was pronouncing a prophecy. He says, okay, wait a minute. I won the affections. Now God's pronouncement is that your seed, the enemy's seed, and the woman's seed is going to have enmity. God's going to somehow flip it around. He's going to change the hearts of humanity. And that's going to take a radical transformation in your heart and my heart. To all of a sudden now say, no, 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 no. God is my friend. God is the lover of my soul, not the enemy. I believe the lie. And God's made a way for the Cain's and Abel to come to him. Because the Cain's and Abel are lost. Both humanities are lost. The prophecies throughout the whole Old Testament, using Israel as the model, is that he's going to bring both houses together. Ooh, I wish I had more time to hit that puppy. But, man, that is going to be awesome. God's in the business of healing and restoring and setting people free. And when you and I don't trust him for the outcomes. God's going to turn man's heart back. And right there in verse 15, he says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring or seed and hers, and he will crush your head and you will strike his heel. And so God's purpose 
in the beginning has always been that he has to destroy evil and sin so that he doesn't have to destroy you and me. And on the cross and on the fulfillment of that, he gave the enemy a death blow on the cross. Now let's think about this for a second. What, what did the enemy know? What made the enemy go after now the seeds? He went to destroy humanity so that seed would never be born. Now, let me just, okay, I'm not a biologist and I'm not a doctor, okay? So all my, all my doctors in here and whatever, don't, don't send me the email. But this is what I know, but biologically. Women don't have seeds. They have eggs, right? That's correct, they have eggs. And we all know that, that the men are described as having seed. But the scripture this defines it as a seed in a woman. Well, how is that possible? Well, we know is that there's going to be a seed in a woman that was implanted not by man, but by God Almighty himself that was going to birth into a woman. And this, the father of this child was going to have our Abba Father as the daddy. And a virgin girl was going to give birth. And the enemy's been after that seed since the beginning. And we know the truth of that. And that's the reason why the enemy's out there trying to destroy that. Why there's war and sickness and disease and why we've fallen in. And I, I pray that we would trust God and say, okay, Lord, what does it look like for us to have God as our friend and realize that on the cross, yes, the enemy bruised and wounded Christ. But that wasn't permanent. On the cross, the enemy crushed. On, on the cross, Jesus crushed the enemy. And what we know in Scripture is that he got back the keys of death, hell, and the grave. We know that ultimately that there will be no more tears, no more whipping, no more sickness again because Jesus won the victory on our behalf. And are we allowing that prophetic message? When we come to Christmas, what does that mean to you? And I want to ask this question. How is your relationship with God today? Not yesterday. Yesterday's gone. You and I can't live on yesterday's laurels. Every single day. How is our relationship? And that's not a guilt or shame thing. That's an encouragement to say, listen, your Abba Father has poured out his affections. You can run to him. You can trust him. You can lay down all of your concerns, your circumstances, your pain, your finances, your sickness, your hurts. Everyone could have rejected you, but your daddy in heaven, even at this moment in the beginning, has not rejected you. And if you would listen and hear his voice, and be born again by the power of the resurrection, which proves that he has purchased you. That you could live a life, a beautiful life of purpose and destiny. And instead, not choose to live the life the enemy wants you to have, which is average. Oh, I want to be average. Who in the world ever thinks that? As a kid, oh, I just wish I was average. I just, I wish I lived an average life with average kids and an average wife. I mean, who, who says that? I don't even think we ever even think that. But maybe sometimes in our minds, we believe the lies of the enemy and deceived us and said, that's all I deserve. And I'm telling you, that's a lie. You are a son and a daughter of a king. You have been adopted into the family of God. He has purchased you and me with a price. We are now heirs to the kingdom. We are beautiful in God's sight. We are worthy, not because we've earned it, because he's poured out his affections on us. And I pray you would live in that anointing. I pray that you would allow that to soak deep. I pray that you would continue to allow the truth of God to go deep in your heart and you would never, ever, ever live in the lie of the enemy and think that you're average or less than average. You are extraordinary. 
And when we come to this Advent season, to Christmas, that, my friends, is a prophetic message to you. That you are so extremely, infinitely valuable to God that he came to crush the head of the serpent because you and I couldn't. Because we were struggling and hurting. And I, only thing I could see for us is really to, how do we respond to this great message? As you and I need to consider how our relationship with God. And I want to just suggest to you a few, few options. One, you have to decide which humanity you want to be in. Cain or Abel. And that requires confession. You and I, Bible throughout all scripture, confession is the issue. We have to confess with our mouths that I am not able, but my God is able. I want to make him number one in my life. I need him to be my savior, my redeemer. He's the one who gives me the victory over my finances, over my relationships, over people not liking me or whatever. And we need to confess. And after we confess, God gives us the power to obey. Obey to say, Lord, I am not going to listen to the enemy. I am now not under bondage and slavery. I have now power in Christ Jesus through the Holy Spirit to be able to resist the devil and tell him, no, I will not do that. I will not violate anybody else. I will not steal and cheat and hurt. Not because, oh, I hope God loves me more. It's because now I got the power in God to live in victory. And I will pray. Because this is what I know. And I know that pretty much what I'm going to say, really, I think women get this way better than men do. Okay? But the reason why we pray is because we want to smell like Jesus. Okay, and what I mean by that, and this is what I mean by women get this. If I go to my wife and I give her a hug, I'm not really thinking about it, but she'll smell me naturally. I guess women do that. And if she smells somebody else's perfume on me other than hers, <laughs> whoo, oh my Jesus, something's going on, all right? And this is what that tells her. That tells her that you are in too close of proximity with somebody else that maybe you shouldn't have been with. On a spiritual connotation, we want to be so close to Jesus that when I say we smell like him, that we, our character, our thinking, our speech, our actions towards others are just like Jesus. And that's why we pray, and that's why we build intimacy with him, so that we would be his hands and feet and reflect that into the world. And so we confess, we obey, and we pray. Now let's all stand. I believe the best way for us to begin that, and this is why worship, we begin with worship and we end with worship. That is what you're going to see through scripture from the beginning. Worship. Mission is going to end. Everything is going to end. One thing for a believer's life will never end is our worship of him, our praise and adoration here on earth and ultimately up in heaven. And that's why we begin and end in worship. Now, right now, as we're going to close in worship, I pray that you would consider what does it look like for confession in your heart? What does it look like for you to say, okay, Lord, I need to obey. I need to trust you. I need power from heaven to help me to get through Christmas, help me get through family gatherings, to help me get through co-workers that are on so much medication, they should be home. And I, whatever that may look, I don't know. You know? But you're going to have to work with them Monday morning, and you know what I mean. And so, you, you power, Lord, I need power, power. I need power from heaven. Thank you, Father God. Lord, we come and, Lord, con consume us. Help us, Lord, to be consumed by your loving kindness. You are Abba Father. Lord, you, Lord, who have poured out your affections on your people, that you and your loving kindness have made out this plan for our salvation and redemption 
to turn our hearts radically transformed back to you. And Lord, how you have purposed us to reign and live and to be adopted as your sons and daughters. And Father, help us to go out into the world and to reach out and proclaim your message, Lord, that God is reaching out to all the Cain's and Abel's out there. Return back to God, for he loves us. And you are an ocean, and may we sink in you like we never have before. In Jesus' precious name, amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful evening, and I hope to see you here at 3 o'clock tonight.